Hello world, welcome to Point and Quickie. Here's a game where you neither point nor click. This is Nine Witches Family Disruption, made by Blowfish Studios, published by Indisruption. It's available on PC via Steam or GOG.com, and also on PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch, and it begins something like this. It's October 1944, and weird things are happening in a Norwegian town because Nazis. Since it's a known fact that Nazis have absolutely zero chill when it comes to the occult, the Allies enlist Alexei Krakowitz, a professor of occult science, to stop this heinous, wicked, unbelievably stupid scheme. And so the professor heads off with his unnecessarily faithful assistant Akiro Kakasawa to go heck this plan up. By infiltrating a party. It makes sense, I promise. So, obvious feature that makes this game stand out number one, or Oftimigitsu one for short, is that you have two protagonists. For obvious reasons, you control one at a time, but you can switch between them at will, and the one you're not controlling will follow close behind. Turns out the reason the professor even has an assistant is that he's quadriplegic, hence the wheelchair. He can't even pick up items or interact with anything. You'd think he'd just send the able-bodied Akiro out on this mission instead, but the professor does have a special skill. He can project his spirit out of his body and commune with the souls of the dead. At least, assuming said soul has yet to pass to the higher up place or the upper place. This also allows you to do some super sneaky reconnaissance past locked doors and the like. That also means that Akiro has to go it alone when confronted with obstacles that a wheelchair can't pass through. Weirdly, that almost never becomes a factor in puzzles. There's a few times where Akiro will be on his own, but I fully expected more situations where he would have to find a way to let the professor cross an obstacle. Not so much though, I think there's only one. Obvious feature that makes this game stand out number two is the control scheme. The game encourages the use of a controller, although it allows keyboard controls also. We've seen this in the Telltale style games and the games inspired by them, but it's not often used for the traditional side-on perspective titles. No use for a mouse though, which is quite a rarity in this genre, it has to be said. Side note, I don't think the keyboard controls actually work if you have a gamepad plugged in, so I'm not sure how good they are. As for how the gamepad controls work, imagine the Telltale control scheme mapped to a 2D game. Left stick to move around, face buttons to do stuff. I'll go with the Xbox mappings for this description, but you have the option to select either Xbox or PlayStation prompts. X button examines stuff, A button interacts with stuff, Y button brings up your inventory, or somersault. I think that's a joke though, I never did pull that off. Wouldn't be the first joke of its kind in the game, considering this is what happens when you select the extended cut option on the main menu. As for the B button, well, it depends on the character. For the professor, B will toggle his astral projection on and off. For Akiro, we have to move on to obvious feature standout yada yada number 3. This game has combat in it, and B button is how you make guns do a bang. You'll get a small pistol of infinite ammo to start with, doing low damage as well as being prone to jamming at random. That wouldn't be so bad if you simply couldn't fire for a moment. Not letting you move until the jam is cleared escalates that problem a bit more I reckon. You can also do a dodge roll with the Y button, as well as pick up other weapons with the A button. Those weapons trade higher power for limited ammunition, mind you. Now, this might be a me problem, but the hardest part of those sections was getting into a firing position whilst facing the right direction. I kept moving up to the right level, then accidentally turning myself around. Ah oh well, I never properly got on with analog sticks in the first place. Could be why I found those sections so difficult and had to keep retrying. Then again, I could have sold my soul to lower the difficulty of combat, so perhaps that one's on me. Oh, and sometimes you have to stop the professor from being killed at the same time, in case you found the early fights a bit too easy. If you're expecting me to rally against this heinous perversion of the point and click paradigm, then I'm going to have to disappoint you. It works. It works fine. The combat provides a change of pace without being so frequent that it fundamentally changes the type of game you're playing. As for the mere fact that the controls aren't mouse-based, I think there's a case to be made for a game that you can comfortably play on the couch. And no, you cannot convince me that using a wireless mouse on a couch is properly comfortable in the same way a gamepad is. That said, the option of both would be the most convenient and accessible way of doing things. Speaking of, you can't remap the controls. Boo. 
Apart from that, the worst thing I could say about these controls is that you're forced to only interact with hotspots that you can physically reach. And even if the game did call upon you to do that, all you'd need to do is use the professor's astral projection ability to reach it. You can float around the whole screen. If the game is explicitly designed around those controls, it can work. And like Grim Fandango before it, this game proves that. So that's a fair amount of things that don't feature in your average adventure game, and you'll encounter them all in the first 10 minutes. Starting with a section in the professor's home, which acts as a wee tutorial and sets up the story. You're into a combat sequence after that, before finally arriving somewhere you'll become very familiar with. This map screen here. The game has a bunch of locations, this will let you walk between them. And boy will you be walking between locations. A lot. Especially in the later part of the game, where the map expands into two areas. On the one hand, this gives the game a very open feel, like you're able to explore a world without having to wind your way through screen after screen to get to where you want. It's a more direct approach. On the other hand, the game can sometimes have you travelling between the farthest two points on the map, then make you wind your way through screen after screen anyway because these locations aren't restricted to one screen. Nor is the game immune to the tropes of the fetch quests or prolonging a puzzle with a just one more thing type of complication. There's a lot of legwork involved is what I'm saying, and honestly I'd started getting tired of it by the end of the game. You might encounter an object hours before you can do anything with it, so you either need a good memory or be willing to backtrack to old areas. Hell, you might need to do that once or twice regardless. Certain areas can change as the story progresses, although the game usually indicates that change to you with a cutscene. So if you're not okay with a wee wander about, this game might not be for you. If you are that way inclined, however, there's a lot to find. The Professor's Astral Projection ability is a tool that opens up a lot of puzzle possibilities. A large open world means lots of character interaction and plenty of potential for humorous dialogue. I can't say I found the game particularly funny, but I think it just might be hard to please in that regard. The developers aren't above including a boatload of scatological humour, put it that way. Not to mention that you have the local town, the surrounding houses, a forest and a secret Nazi compound to explore. The game places a lot at your feet, so if exploration is what you want, this has you covered. And aside from being expected to either remember something you saw hours prior or go on a big ol' wander when you get stuck, the puzzles make sense. I did use a walkthrough once or twice to find out which location I had to go back to or find an item I missed. On that note, the game does let you highlight hotspots. It's what the Y button does when the professor is in floaty ghost mode. Only works within a certain radius, however, and if you're in one of those sections that only a hero can access, you're out of luck entirely. Now, despite everything I've said about how this game plays and the changes it makes to the established formula, it is still, undoubtedly I'd say, an adventure game. I mean, if infiltrating a secret Nazi compound to stop a nefarious world domination plot doesn't qualify as an adventure, I don't know what does. You solve puzzles, you do an explore, it's definitely got that adventure game spirit behind it. As for whether or not you should buy the thing, that's trickier. It's around £16 at the time of writing, and that might be higher than you're used to paying for an adventure game. It doesn't have voice acting, but it took me around 5 hours to get through. So I think the price is okay, leaning towards expensive without toppling all the way into too much. What you've got here is a game with a silly sense of humour, and an even sillier title, which is good for spending some time on the couch, or wherever is comfier for you to sit with a controller. Maybe an hour at a time, maybe more if the exploration aspect takes you. I wouldn't say it's a calming game by any means, not when a gunfight can break out at a minute's notice. But it's nice to not have to sit at a computer or find a wireless mouse that accepts your sofa cushions as a viable surface. If you're not in love with that idea, then wait for a sale. Oh, one more thing. I'm not sure if you can pet the dog, but you can certainly interact with it. I'm almost certain the cat is not up for pettings though. And that's it for 2020. Thanks for joining me this year. Whatever you did, I'm glad to have you. Feel free to leave a comment and let me know what you thought of the video, of the game, what you had for breakfast, the usual. And the Patreon is still there if you want to contribute money, get these videos two days early, or both. Thanks again, take care, and I'll see you in the new year.